subscribe to our YouTube channel, Joy Learning TV. Hello and welcome. I am Frank Edu Asare, and I'll be leading you in our history discussions on the Joy Learning Hour. You can call me Wolof. But before we proceed, this is how we we'll do it. When I say history time, you respond African history time. So let's do it. History time, African history time. Great, great, great. That's how it will go. Yeah, so it is Senior High School 1. And our topic for discussion today is Introduction to African History. At the end of the day, this is what I expect you to tell yourselves, to tell your parents, and to tell your friends in confidence. I expect you, my friends, um, to be able to mention the Greek word from which history is derived. Again, I want you to be able to explain the forms history is used. Students also should be able to state five reasons why it is important to study African history. Again, students should be able to identify the main sources of African history. And last but not the least, students will be able to at least one each of the merits and demerits of the sources of African history. So my friends, let's set sail. History is derived from the Greek word historia, which means inquiry. So take it there. History means inquiry. History means research. Synonyms of inquiry. History means find out. So it is not a simple subject. The subject began to develop in the 5th century BC as a result of efforts to understand and explain the human past in a rational way. History, therefore, is a branch of learning which aims at satisfying man's curiosity about the past. The subject history explains how people, ideas, institutions, beliefs, traditions have changed from one generation to another. And that is key. Out of history, today we are able to tell from where we have come from since independence to today, how we have transformed, how we have we have changed our institutions, how we have become in terms of our culture and even our political systems. And so that is the essence of history. The term history is used in three ways mainly. One, to satisfy man's eager and desire to know what happened in the past. And this is very critical. It is important that we get to know what happened yesterday. In fact, re relevant issues that happened yesterday. And that will inform us as to the decisions to make today and also to help us in planning for tomorrow. Secondly, the subject is used to refer to everything that has gone on in the past, either documented or undocumented. And that is it. The fact that we don't have documented information does not mean it is not, his, it is not his history. It is. At a certain point in time, we document. Another point in time, we don't. And the fact that it's not documented does not mean it is not history and it's not relevant. It is indeed relevant. Finally, it is a systematic study and recording of significant events of the past. Take it again. It is the st systematic study and recording of significant events of the past. Yes. History is not just like that. History deals with significant events, recording important events and rational events of yesterday. So let's give ourselves an example. Not too long ago, in 2013, there was um, an election petition, of course, which went to the Supreme Court. This is a significant event, and therefore it has been recorded. And this is history for the generations to come. Well, largely, Herodotus is regarded as the father of history. Fortunately, we have... Um, a picture of him, I must admit that this was coiled from, um, from the internet. So this is a figure of Herodotus that you see on your screens. Now, 
we've, we've got into a very important section of our discussions today. And that is, why do we study African history? Why do we study history? More often than not, um, I mean, people try to muscling our subject, but history is very, very relevant. So with Vim, at the end of the lesson, I want you to tell yourselves, tell your friends, um, tell your colleagues the reasons why we have to study our history, the reasons why we have to study our past. To begin with, the study of African history is to inspire us to emulate good people. By this, we study the good deeds of people that made them great and popular, learn from their mistakes and failures. For example, the brave police officer, Captain Salifu Dagati, who laid his life down to save the president, Dr. Kwame Nkrumah, from an assassinated attempt on the 2nd of January, 1964. This is a very significant event. And Captain Salifu Dagati, at any point in time, should be hailed as a hero. He laid his life down um, for the president or the first gentleman of the nation. And this is a good deed. I mean, we should be able to sacrifice. We should be able to sacrifice for our country, for our communities, and for our families. And because we are learning from the good deeds of um, Captain Salifu Dagati, what it means is that we can also do it. We can also sacrifice and, and help our country, help our communities, and help our families. Again, the study of African history promotes national harmony and integration. Through the study of history, we learn to appreciate and respect the cultural differences of the diverse ethnic groups that make up the continent. This is, this is a fantastic point. So in Ghana, I'm, I am pretty sure that even in your class, you have, I mean, your class is a mini Ghana, I should tell you, because in your class, you have different ethnic groups coming together to form the history class in your schools. And I'm sure in the class, there's harmony. I'm sure in your class, there's friendship. I'm sure in your class, there's love. And that is how we live. History tells us that as we learn from ourselves, from the various ethnic groups, the diversity of the country, of the continent, we are able to live together as one people. And that is what is important for, for us as a people. Nobody at any point in, at any point in time should um, disturb the peace, the unity, and harmony of our country and the continent. So if tomorrow somebody comes in the name of one ethnic group or the other to knock heads with your knowledge in history, you should be able to tell the person, please, we've, we, we, we've gone too far and we know what is important for us because we know in history we need to live together as one people. So that is another significant um, point that we need to note when it comes to reasons why we study African history or we study our history. The third point, the study of African history teaches moral values such as faithfulness, courage, and endurance. For example, in the history of Asante, Yasantua, the Queen Mother of Ajiso, led the Asante in their last resistance against the British in the War of 1900 to 1901. The study of the lives of these great men and women strengthens our determination to achieve even greater things for posterity. Yes. So there are very important personalities in the country that we can always learn from. And one example is what we've given, and that is the Queen Mother of Ejisoya Santua. We can never forget another hero of our country, Osu Alatamanche, Niko Binaboni. These are people who, who courageously led the, the, the Ghanaian people to victory as we are today. So it is important that we learn values from our forebears. And out of that, we, also, we should also be able to do the same for our country during our time. So that the generation unborn will also learn from us to do greater things for the country and for the continent. On your screens, you, you can see the picture of Yasantua um, bravely brandishing her gun and in her war, smoke. On your right side, you see special acknowledgement written to um, Captain Salifu Dagati, who laid his life 
um, down for the first president of the Republic of Ghana. These are the people that we need to celebrate at any point in time. We can also add by saying that we study African history to be patriotic, to be law-abiding and nationalistic. My friends, how much do you love your country? I'm just asking. For example, the roles played by nationalists like Dr. J.B. Dankwa, J.E. Kesley Hayford, John Manson Saba, and Dr. Kwame Nkrumah during the independence struggle and eventually independence inspire us to love our country and emulate their patriotic zeal. This is very important. And so we have people that we can always learn from. How patriotic are you, my brother? How patriotic are you, my friend? How patriotic are, are you as a student? Do you just um, throw rubbish around anyhow? Do you love your country? I'm not sure. Do you follow the simple instructions um, given to us to follow as a country? I'm not sure. If you do, then indeed you are a patriotic person. Are you ready to die for Ghana? If indeed you are, as younger persons come in, I know you're going to be great uh, men and women in future. What is it that you have for, for the country? Do you really love Ghana? Do you really love the continent? If you do, then I tell you, corruption will be a thing of the past. Ethnic bigotry will be a thing of the past. Environmental disorder, if I should say, throwing things about anyhow will be a thing of the past. Because if you're a patriotic citizen of the country, if you're a nationalist, if you love Ghana, all of these things you wouldn't do. And Ghana will be a great place to live, a very beautiful country to live in as such. Let's move on. The study of African history makes us aware of the contributions Africans have made towards the world's civilization. Very important point there. By studying African history, we know that Egyptians created the earliest alphabets of ABCD that form the basis of written language today. How many of us did we know this? That the, the alphabet that we use in the English language today originated from Egypt. And the Egypt we are talking about was and is the African Egypt we are talking about. So with this, history is teaching us that we are not just any other people. We are men and women of civilization. And so take note, out of history, we've gotten to know that Egyptians created the earliest alphabets. So why can't we be proud as Africans? Why can't we? I thought we should be, able, we should be proud as Africans and love ourselves. The study of African history has uncovered the hidden facts about the continent. That, that is, through African history, we have gotten to know that the birthplace of mankind is in Africa. Great! Africa is a cradle of civilization. Africa is a home of mankind. So why do we chip in ourselves? We should be proud as a people because history is telling us that indeed it was in Africa that um, mankind was giving birth to. And so that is it. It is important that we get to know. So this and many others are the reasons why we study African history. To know our past, to be informed about our past, and to be able to move on chest high, knowing that we, we come from a background of civilization. Now, friends, to be able to be a scholar or to be able to, you know, write, enjoy your history, there are sources that one has to go and tap information from. There are sources that one has to go and gather information from. So as we proceed, we are going to look at the sources of African history. Where are the sources that one can go to gather historical information from? It's very important because without that, we don't have history. Without that, we can write. Without that, we can never reconstruct our past. Now, the sources of information available to the historian to write African history may be classified into two. These are documentary or written sources of history and non-documentary or unwritten sources of history. So these are the two sources that one can go and tap historical information from. These are two. The two are documentary sources and 
non-documentary sources or written records and non-written records. These are the two sources that one can gather historical information from. But then let's throw some more light on what we mean by this. Now, documentary sources of history. These are records acquired by writing down events of the past and the present. They are materials intended to communicate historical facts. They are recorded or records acquired by writing down. Documented or written records are records that are written down. And they are meant to communicate historical facts. There are two types of documentary sources or written sources of history. These are primary and secondary sources. Now take note. We are saying that to gather historical information, there are two sources. These are written records and non-written records. Now within the written records, we have two sources. These are primary sources and secondary sources. Now let us get to know what a primary source is. Now primary sources, these are written by people who were present to witness and record the events as they unfolded. So they include information gathered from diaries, magazines, journals, periodicals, reports of inquiry, court records, political party manifestos, and minutes of meetings, private correspondences, and government official reports. Now let's throw some little light on this. We are saying that primary sources are the sources written by people who were present to, who were present to witness and record the events as they unfolded. Yes. And this could be found in diaries, magazines. So a very practical example, my friend. I mean, you may be a student from which of whichever, I mean, of the secondary schools. For example, you may be a student of Pope John Secondary School and Junior Seminary. So as a first year student, you get to the school and you begin to put down a diary. You write a diary. Or you may be a student of any of the schools. I don't think senior high school or which of them. Your first day in the school, you can begin to put down a documentary source of, of information. And this is how you do it. You take a diary. So whatever that happens from your first day till the day you vacate, you can put it down in a diary. Or for example, anytime you go to the dining the happenings in the dining hall, you can have a diary on it. And this becomes an important documentary source for you. After you've completed school, you can always refer to it. And you have it in hand, so it is handy. Magazines. There are a lot of information that one can gather from magazines. Periodicals. Reports of inquiry. Political party money. They are there. They put it down themselves. The political party put it down themselves. They put it in a book. And so it's a primary source of document for them. Um, private correspondence. So you write a letter. I mean, it's your own letter. So you are there. You are present. And you are writing it. Government officials report. They go for cabinet meetings, they write reports, and they are there. It's a primary source of documents for them. As a matter of fact, they witness it, and they are there, and it's a present document. So example of um, a magazine that I show you, of which you have um, somebody that we all know, um, Martin Luther King Jr., um, Grayson the front page of a magazine. So this is one of the primary sources as an example. Now let's move on to the secondary source. These are written records based on oral traditions, archeology, span ethnobotany, and other sources of, of history. They are events recorded by people who did not witness the events themselves, but depended on them to write. They are produced for use for future generations. They include genealogical materials, inscriptions, calendars, and biographies. So that is it. Secondary sources, the, the, the writer is not there at present, but the person depends on secondary information. So you are writing a, a biography of, of somebody. You are writing a biography of your dad. You are writing a biography of somebody that you admire so much. You can gather information um, on the life of the person and you put it down as a biography. So again, there's an oral, oral tradition. You gather an information that somewhere along the line, 
there's a burial site somewhere close by your house or by your school. And that burial site was where very prominent persons um, were buried. Yes, I mean, out of this information, you will be able to write something. I mean, you gather that information as a primary source, oral tradition, and then you put it down in a book, and that becomes a secondary source for you. On your screens, you see a biography of our former president, J.A. Kufo. So this is a secondary source. His life and somebody has written on the life of our former president. And this, um, the author was Ivor Ajimandia. He wrote on the life, the biography of our former president. And this became a secondary source. Because the life, the day-to-day life of the, pre, of the former president, um, the author was not there. But he gathered information. He interviewed and gathered information. And that helped the person to put down uh, the secondary source of information. So basically, these are the two um, sources under documentary source. And this is the explanation. Primary source, you are there and present. So you are a news reporter, you get to the place of an incident and you report because you witness it live. And the information you bring is a primary source. Later, somebody takes over that information that you, you put, probably you put in a book, it becomes a secondary source for somebody else. And so this is the difference between the two. Primary source and secondary sources of documented information or written sources. Now, advantages of documentary sources of info. I mean, as you sit there, you can, you know, be, be telling yourselves, I mean, what could be an advantage of a, of a documentary source? Information that is in a book, information that is in a magazine, information that is in a, in a periodical. What could be an advantage of this? Let's look at it. Historians and other research, researchers depend on such written works for information about achievements and failures of important people, communities, states, and kingdoms. So as we explained earlier, a primary source gathers information which, of which the person would be at the scene. He puts it down in a book and becomes a secondary source for anybody who will have access to it. And out of that, you'll be able to tell. So for our former president, um, former president J. Kufo, you take his book and then you'll be able to know the life of him what has been his achievement, what has been some challenges that have come his way. And it builds you, it gives you an information as to how to also lead your life. Two, documented information can be found in a book or in a pamphlet, and that can be kept for years. And it's true. I know you have some documents or some books that were given to you as gifts, as prizes, and you still have them. And it's all because it is handy. It is all because it is written. It's all because it's in the form of a book. So you can keep it for years and years and years. And your, you know, the, the generation coming after you can also come and have access um, to it. So that is one important use of a documentary source of history. Whatever information you have and you put it in a book, you can keep it and people can also have access um, to it later in the years. Three, they come in handy and can be carried from one place to another. This is true, and I know you know it. That once you have a documented material, you have it in a book, you have it in a magazine, you have it as a party manifesto, or whatever form documented, you can keep it with you. You can put it in your pocket. You can put it in your car. You can put it in your bag. And wherever you go, you can have it with you. When you are traveling even beyond the shores of Ghana, you can have the document with you. So that is it. It is handy. It is handy. You can take it wherever you go and it's accessible as well so that you can refer to it at any point in time. So, for example, our constitution. The constitution is in a book and so you can carry it wherever you go and make reference to it. Four, they can even be, they can even be posted from one country to another. By this, inf by this information can spread worldwide in an easier manner yes so today we can assess um, information we can assess documented information from from nigeria from togo from from south africa from south sudan why because it is in a document form and therefore it is easier for us to have access they can be posted on the internet 
They can be posted to you through mails, and you can have access to their documents. So that is it. It becomes easier for information to spread worldwide. And so we'll be sitting here and we'll have information about um, some happenings or something that has happened before, as I said, in, say, Kenya, in, say, Burkina Faso. Why? Because it is handy. Why? Because it is a documented material. And so you can have access to it. Finally, this makes documented history more accessible than oral tradition and archaeology. So that is it. We are going to go into what archaeology and oral tradition means. But then once you have it in a book, once you have a documented material, once you have a, a historical information that is written down, what it means is that it is easily accessible. It is easily accessible. You can always go for it. You can always make reference to it. So I said, um, so the document on the, the presidential petition in 2013, the document, all the rulings is documented. And so at any point in time, you can go for it, reference it, see what happened, read it, and then gather information from it. So documented materials, documented history are more accessible than oral tradition and archaeology. Now, as we discuss merits, as we look at advantages, there's no way we, can, we don't have to look at challenges. Because as they say, I mean, when there are merits, when there are advantages, um, likely to be some challenges with whatever the situation is. So let's look at some disadvantages of documented or documentary sources of African history. This, with what we've looked at from the advantages, you should be able to to tell us, tell the person sitting beside you what you think may be some of the challenges with documented materials. I mean, just, just a second, think about it. All right, so let's go into it. Documentary sources cannot be fully correct. Facts can be deliberately distorted to suit the purposes of the writer. And this is true. This is true. So people sometimes write from some biased point of view. So in as much as you may have a documented material, which is historical, great material, there could also be biases because the person might be writing from his own point of view and may be attaching some emotions, particularly from where he or she may be coming from. If the person is writing from something about himself, his country or his ethnic group, they are bound to be exaggerations, deliberations. I mean, there is bound to be uh, exaggerations um, to distort the real facts about the situation on the ground. The writer can be biased in recording an event. In as much as the first point, as we indicated, um, the writer can deliberately distort historical information. I mean, whenever, even situations where there are facts which probably might incriminate, the person might decide not to bring in. So, the person would have distorted the facts. Now we are also saying that a writer may be biased from where the person is coming from. So for example, if you are writing about your school, and even, even within the school, if you are writing something about your class, if you are not careful, you'll be biased um, towards the other classes because that is where you are. So the writer can be biased in recording an event. That is one challenge with documentary source. The writer, there could be biases in events that are recorded. Three, written sources are scarce in Africa. This is because the art of writing developed late on the continent. But that does not mean that we do not have history. The fact that history developed late does not in any way mean that we don't have rich and credible history to talk about. Apart from ancient Egypt, where a form of writing called hieroglyphics had started before 3000 BC, much of Africa lacked any form of writing. Yet again, it does not mean that we did not have history. The fact that we did not write, it does not in any way mean that we did not have history that is worth talking about. The absence of this meant that most parts of Africa were unable to keep records, written records until late in their history. So that is one of the challenges with um, documented material. A lot of the times, 
um, African communities did not put down events in terms of writing. And so um, some events might have been missed out. But that is it. Written sources are scarce in Africa. Why? Because um, for a long period of time, we were not putting down records in terms of writing. Yes, so we are back. And um, as we said, the sources of writing or the sources of gathering historical information from are two, written and unwritten sources. So now that we are done with the written sources, the written sources, as we said, are the sources where information are put down or information is kept in a book so that one can make reference to and assess it at any point in time. We said the sources are two when it comes to written document, written or documentary sources, we said they are primary sources and secondary sources. The primary source is when and where the person is present and records the events. Secondary source depends on a primary source to be able to write. But all of these are important for the writing of African history or the reconstruction of the African past. So having talked about that, let's look at the non-documentary. What, what, what do we mean by non-documentary source or sources of African history? Now, it is a branch of history which is not written down. Non-documentary sources, what it means is that it is a branch of history which is not written down. So long before the art of writing was adopted in Africa, the non-documentary sources such as ethnography, oral tradition, ethnobotany, archaeology, numismatics, etc. were the only means by which African history was recorded. So this is it. Long before the advent of writing, there were sources, there were means by which the African past was, was kept and recorded, but not recorded in a book. Now these are the sources. The sources are ethnography, oral tradition, ethnobotany, archaeology, numismatics. And these were the only means by which the African history was recorded. Let's look at the sources one after the other. And I mean the non-documentary sources. Let's look at archaeology. Archaeology. I hope you've heard of this where this term um, a lot of times and probably some of you want to be archaeologists what do they do what is archaeology now this is a study of ancient objects and materials found on the surface or excavated from the ground so that is what archaeologists does they gather information they get hints and they move on they move on to find objects historical materials probably could be found on the surface of the earth or sometimes they excavate. And by excavation, they dig. They dig to gather the information. And that is what archaeologists does. This is the study of ancient objects and materials found on the surface or excavated from the ground. Material remains found on the surface or excavated from the ground. Archaeology provides useful information about how man in the past adapted his way of life to suit his natural environment. So how, how was man living? How was man living comfortably? Well, was he using tools? What, was he cooking? These are the things, these are the material remains that when archaeologists come out with, helps us to understand man better. And that is the work of the archaeologists. Relics like bows and arrows, holes and cutlasses would indicate whether the people who lived there were either hunters or farmers. Plenty of skulls and skeletons would suggest that war or massacre has taken place in an area at a period. So this is it. Through archaeology, so archaeology may, 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 may have a, a lead. An oral traditionalist might suggest or might tell an archaeologist that somewhere around um, once upon a time there was a war and so person believes that you know that place might have been a burial ground to further confirm the archaeologists will move there will excavate to find out material remains and so the, the archaeologists get to know that 
um, he finds skulls, skeletons, bows and arrows, then it will indicate that indeed some conflict took place, some war took place, and those were the dead, and those would also be the materials, the implement, the tools, the weapons that they used. And that is archaeology. On your screens, you find a picture of archaeologists on site. So here they are excavating, and you can see it's a skeletal remain. This person might have been an important person who was buried somewhere. And with a lead, the archaeologists have gone there, did their research, done their findings, and they have been able to, on point, um, get to the remains of such a person. And so this is the work of the archaeologists. They dig, they excavate, they gather material remains, and that helps in throwing more light on our history. What are advantages of archaeology? What are adv has it got advantages? I'm asking you, my friends sitting there. Yes, archaeology has advantages, a lot of them. So let's go into it. Through archaeology, it has come to light that the history of man started in Africa and it dates from the ancient past. Dr. and Mrs. Leakey discovered the fossils of man-like creature in 1959 at a site on Olduvai Gorge in northern Tanzania. That clearly was the evidence of human culture in the world. So with the help of archaeologists, we have been able to identify, we have been able to locate, indeed, human culture beginning from the continent. And by this, skeletal remains of a man-like creature was discovered in 1959 at a site in Tanzania called Oduvai Gorge. Oduvai Gorge in northern Tanzania. Here, archaeologists discovered through their works of a human-like creature, which clearly speak to the fact that Africa is the home of mankind. Africa is a cradle of human culture. And that is a clear example. Again, archaeology helps us to date events. This is done through radiocarbon dating. This is a scientific way of dating um, events with the usage of the material remains that they find. So if they found the skeletal remain through their, their, their works, they are able to date the years um, of, that, of that skeletal remain. And it helps us in throwing more light on how man has come that far. Archaeology has contributed more than any other source to our knowledge of the rich material culture of African civilization, such as Zimbabwe, ancient Ghana Empire, Ibu Uku in Nigeria, because all of these civilizations definitely had materials, and these materials spoke a lot about the, the civilization of these people. So ancient Ghana Empire had a lot, and out of that findings, it speaks that ancient Ghana was one of the most important Western, Western Sudanese medieval empires. And so we are proud of that as such. So Zimbabwe, the Zimbabwe ruins, Zimbabwean civilization, a lot of things have, have happened. And it's through the work of archaeologists that we are able to know. All right, so having gotten to know the advantages of archaeology, having got to know the advantages of archaeology, let's look at some of the disadvantages or demerits of archaeology. Archaeological research is time and energy consuming. I mean, just check it. You will travel, you will go with your bags, you will go with your tools, implements, to far off place. What are you going to do? You are going to excavate, you are going to find material remains. And of course, with such an activity, it is time. You need time to search. You need time to identify the exact spot that you want to excavate. And so it is time and energy consuming. You expend a lot of energy through this, um, this research work 
uh, by the archaeologists. So archaeology or archaeological research is time and energy consuming. Wherever you say it in your exams and you are looking at the disadvantages of archaeology, we've already looked at the advantages. When you are looking at the disadvantages, this is one of them. Archaeology is or archaeological research is time and energy consuming. Artifacts are sometimes disfigured, hence making it difficult to interpret them. And that is true. If an artifact, if a material remain has been underground for years upon years upon years, definitely it will disfigure. And so when it, they find it and it has disfigured, it becomes difficult for them to interpret it. It becomes difficult for them to interpret it. So another disadvantage of archaeology or archaeological research is that Sometimes the material remains they discover might have been disfigured, hence making it difficult to interpret, to interpret them what they mean and, and, and stuff like that. The next one is that accurate dates are not used in archaeology. So, say about, around. Since radiocarbon dating is always approximate, it is difficult to rely on dates given by archaeologists. So even with the help of um, uh, with the help of radiocarbon dating, which is so much important in archaeological work and so much important in African history, what we are saying as one of the challenges with archaeology is that the years are almost always approximation. So it is around, about, and so you don't have the definite um, year, you don't have the definite age, you don't have the definite interpretation, and so this is one. Of the challenges that archaeology faces. Again, it is human beings who reconstruct history from archaeological evidence. Hence, the element of subjectivity sometimes crops up in their interpretation of artifacts and the context in which they are found. So again, uh, because it's human beings who do the job, human beings who go and, I mean human beings who are archaeologists, more often than not you find um, sub subjectivity uh, when it comes to interpretation and so it is a challenge due to the subjective subjectivity that crops up in the interpretation of this you don't you don't have the exact uh, meaning of what they want to put across so subjectivity is one of the challenges now let's quickly look at the merits again through archaeology it has come to light that history of man started in africa so Africa is a cradle of human culture. We've also said that it helps, in, it helps us to date events, and this is through the help of radiocarbon dating. Archaeology, again, has contributed more in exposing the rich African culture, or rich African civilization, to the world. And we said that the merits are archaeology research, archaeological research is time and energy consuming. Artifacts may be disfigured and also the subjectivity when it comes to the interpretation of what archaeologists find. The next source, the next source when it comes to non-documentary sources of um, African history is oral tradition. Oral tradition. And what is oral tradition? This is the method by which information on events are obtained through oral stories, folklores, legends, festivals handed down from generation to generation yes almost every day there's oral tradition going on in our homes so your mom may tell you something and then you also tell your kids and that is the cycle oral tradition is going on your dad may teach you something and you also transfer it to your kids and oral tradition is going on oral tradition also includes songs and other forms of music like praise songs drums and horn music. So you come from the palace, you know how to beat a drum. You learnt it. Somebody taught you. So you also teach somebody. So you transfer it um, like that. Now with oral tradition, there are two forms. These are fixed text type. Fixed text type. And the free text type. I said with oral tradition, we have two kinds or two types. These are fixed text type and the free text type. What does that mean? Let's look at a fixed text type. The fixed text type takes the form of music which are passed on unchanged 
from generation to generation. Examples are works of folk music, praise songs, drum and horn music. These are fixed. You don't change it. So an illustration is, is the following line of horn music played at the Chebi Palace. And I hope you've heard this um, song before. Or you also have it in the Yasan. Yasan to Oba Besia Oku Premuanu Waiyebiyajayo. This is it. And from generation to our time, this is how we have been singing it. It doesn't change. And the same goes for Dukia Oba Besia Oku Premuanu. Dukia is a courageous woman who fights before come. That is the meaning. Who fights before canon. This song alludes to a woman called Okuya who demonstrated bravery in the Battle of Akatamanso in 1826. So then anybody, any woman who hears this song, it kind of encourages you. It gives you the energy that you can also do it. It's fixed. It doesn't change. That is one example of the fixed text type. Now let's look at a free text. The free, so now it is fixed. And we are, by fixed, we are saying... The, the song, the horn music, the drum, the drum beat is fixed. You don't change it. And it tells a specific story. The free text type consists of account of events, stool dynamics, that is histories and families or village traditions are example. Now let me take it again. The free text type consists of account of events, stool histories and families or village traditions. Example. Two two histories were in the past recounted by court officials, especially trained to memorize aspects of a state's history. So that is it. You are in a palace and you over over and over you've gotten to know the history of of your town, the history of the, the dynasty of where you come from. It's free. I mean the there's bound to be some changes as you tell the story because it, it has passed down from a generation to, to the other. So such court officials include a linguist. The linguists are trained. They know the tradition of the community. They know the tradition of the palace. And they are able to, to recite. They are able to tell the stories of the communities. Of course, as they tell it and it's precise, there's also bound to be some... Um, some, some biases here and there. And what I mean is that there's bound to be some changes. It is not as if it was when it was passed down from whoever um, told them. With time, it also changes. With time, it also changes. So that is how come we say it is a free text type. So the Groit in Mali and the evening in Gliji, Togo, played similar roles. They play the similar role of telling the stories and histories of their towns, their communities, and their palaces. Such traditional historians, especially the old ones, are working encyclopedias and can be a very useful source for the historical reconstruction of the African past. They have a lot of information. They have a lot of knowledge. Why? Because it has been passed down from a generation to them. And also, they are likely to pass it down to another generation. But the point is that because it's free, it's likely to be some omissions here and there. But that does not negate the fact that they are passing on a very rich historical information to the generation coming. Merits of oral tradition. Oral tradition gives an important source of information in African history. Through this source, Africans have been able to keep their history for several years. This became necessary because the art of writing was unknown to Africa until the latter part of its history. Again, through oral tradition, archaeologists are able to obtain confirmation of what they have they had discovered. This information will reveal the history of a place or region. Thus, archaeologists could first rely on oral tradition before they go on to dig up a place for historical facts. So as I said, archaeologists sometimes rely on leads. So oral tradition might give a lead and archaeologists will follow for confirmation. Oral traditions are easily accessible. One can easily get historical information from oral traditions. In the absence of other sources, oral traditions become the only source of 
of writing African history. Again, oral tradition provides an important source of information in African history. Through this source, Africans have been able to keep their history for several years. This became necessary because the art of writing was unknown to Africa until the latter part of its history. What are the challenges? What are the demerits? What are the disadvantages of oral tradition? Oral traditions are not always reliable, yes. Some essential parts may be lost through memory lapses. Memory lapses may leave room for the retention of only fragmentary bits and partial accounts, which reflect an incomplete picture of the past. Of course, with oral tradition, there may be lapses. I mean, the elders might have, you know, because of aging, might have lost some bits and pieces of the information. So that is it. It is not always reliable. Death, calamity affecting people who are well versed in the history of a place may result in the loss of important information. Of course, when people are blessed with information and they pass on, that would have been the end. So then it is advised that you have information, you are an elderly person, you have information, pass it on to the next generation. Sometimes oral traditions are full of deliberate distortions influenced by the informant's biases and prejudices. Informant tends to exaggerate or distort aspects of the stories to suit their personal interests or the interests of their communities. And this is true. Sometimes we all do it. I have an example where even you, if you are to say something about your school in reference to your class, I am sure I mean, you say some good things about your class I mean, much more than the other classes. So with oral tradition, there's bound to be distortions, there's bound to be biases, there's bound to be exaggerations. Oral traditions, in most cases, cannot give precise dates of events because of aging. People who have the information might have lost it in terms of memory lapses and therefore might not be able to give precise dates as one should. Let's look at the next one, which is also a source and a non-documentary, which is ethnography. This involves the study of rituals and festivals of the people. It studies the present day social institutions as well as the crafts and artistic skills of the Ethnography helps historians to understand present day tradition, technological and socio-political arrangements of a group of people. Brilliant. So this is another source, under non-documentary source of African history, ethnography. So practical example, whenever we celebrate Homo War, in fact, the inception of Homo War, all of us were not there. Inception of Vodra, all of us were not there. But the point is that we reenact, and as we reenact, that is ethnography, we get to understand how, I mean, the meaning of the festival. So if it is hooting at hunger, then we are told that once upon a time there was hunger, then there was a bounty of food, and so we, need to, we needed to celebrate. Once upon a time, for example, according to Kessie, by the people of New Jabin, so they reenact how they moved all the way from old, old Jabin to present day New Jabin. So they reenact. And this is a clear case as an example of ethnography. The historian is provided with useful information for understanding and explaining the past. African rituals and festivals are more often than not reenactments of historical events. Example, as I indicated, according to Kessie, a festival of the New Jabin people is a reenactment of how they migrated from Old Jabin in Asante to their present location in Kofroidia, which is their capital. In Yoruba, in Nigeria, on the first day of annual Egungun festival, a ceremony is performed called Woro. The ceremony is characterized by procession of masqueraders, essentially recalling events associated with the early Yoruba migration into Yoruba land. So the Egungun festival deals with migration, where they were and where they came to. That is what ethnography is about. Advantages of ethnography. It enables us to know more about our past, yes, because if it is about Homo War, if it is about Egungun, if it is about Ojira, or whichever, or the festivals and rituals, it helps us to know 
where we have come from. It helps us to know our past. Very important. It helps historians to understand and appreciate the evolution of present day social political institutions as well as the craft and artistic skills of modern societies. Brilliant carvings, brilliant pottery works, these are all carried over. We learnt it and they help us in appreciating where our past and the skills that we have learnt over the period. It provides a historian with useful information for understanding and explaining the past. African festivals are more often than not a reenactment of historical events. Are there challenges? Yes. With the passage of time, some key aspects of rituals and festivals may be ignored. What could be the reason? Westernization, education, religion. Hence, the true picture of the past may be lost. And it's true. There is bound to be exaggerations from the ethnographer whilst explaining the present-day socio-political institutions to the historian. Again, it is time-consuming. We also look at linguistics. Linguistics is also one of the sources under non-documentary source of African history. These are not written down. These are things that uh, play out in, in, the, in the society or in the community. They are not written down. This is a scientific study of the origin, structure, and changes of a language. A comparative study of languages can provide valuable historical information. For example, if the languages of Ga and Dangwe are studied, it could be noticed that they develop from a single parent language. Yes, linguistic study looks at the structure, the similarity, how close are the languages. And out of that, they'll be able to tell you whether they, the two languages or the three languages or whichever four languages came from a common parent stock. The, the, their songs also provide that they had early contact with the Guan from whom they borrowed a lot. So as I was saying, out of linguistic study, we are able to know, identify whether one, two, three ethnic groups um, out of the language or the songs might have come from a certain stock. And this is through the language that they use. Also, linguistic studies of West Africa languages and Bantu have shown evidence for historians to conclude that ancestors of the modern Bantu speakers originated from the Benue River Valley area in modern Nigeria. And this is so significant. And let's go to South Africa. I mean, the Bantus today can be found, uh, I mean, from migration from the middle Benue River Valley. They migrated down south, and today they can be found in parts of South Africa, Southern Africa, and even in South Africa. So if you know our history, I'm telling you, all that happened, although all that has been happening, there's been four big attacks here and there, would have been stopped because we all come from the same parent stock. Merits of linguistics. Linguistics helps historians to trace the origin of people. Example, the origin of the Bantu, as I was explaining, has been traced by linguistic evidence to Middle Benue River Valley in eastern Nigeria. Pre to the Akan people of Ghana, Shona to Zimbabwe. Through linguistics, historians are able to establish contacts between people. Example, Portuguese words like pano, which is bread, ponko, camel, adaka, box, have found their way into the Akan vocabulary. This testifies that then Portuguese people settled and interacted with some of the coastal people. For example, the Akan in Ghana. The point we are making here is that out of linguistic study, we are able to know, you know, the associations between one, two groups of people. Which one has influenced which one? Because one, two, three groups of people come together, they are bound to be influences. And so words like Pongo or Ponko, which is, has become more or less an Akan language, it is not. It was borrowed from the Portuguese who first came to settle here. Not too long ago, I also discovered that even the word Volta, the word Volta is a Portuguese word, which means meandering. So the Volta River, it meanders. And so the Volta, the Portuguese who first came here and got there, saw how the river meanders. And therefore, the word Volta evolved. So Volta, as I'm telling you, recently discovered 
is also a Portuguese language and has become part of our day-to-day -day vocabulary. Through linguistic study, third one, historians are able to establish the relationship between two or more related languages. Through linguistics, we are able to um, establish the relationship between two or more languages because of similarity in the words that we use. So, for example, we say, Akan, Chi. Chi is big, the Akan language is big, and it has a lot under it. So, Ekwapim, Brong, Fante, we all say the same thing because we come from a common source. Let's look at disadvantages of linguistics. It is expensive to conduct research to obtain linguistic evidence. Research conducted to obtain linguistic evidence to reconstruct African history entails a lot of time. So it is time and energy consuming and it's also expensive. It is time and energy consuming and it's also expensive as part of the challenges or disadvantages of linguistics. Last but not the least, we look at numismatics. This is the study or collection of coins. It deals with all matters relating to coins. From the study of coins, we are able to know how certain states and kingdoms in Africa possessed mint several centuries ago. Numismatists in the 13th century has discovered a large number of coins along the East African Swahili coast. So numismatics is a study of coins. Out of coins, we get to know, um, it gives information. Because on top of the coin, you might find the head of the ruler at the time. You might find the, the year that the mint was, I mean, the coin was minted. And it gives valuable information. On your screens, you find um, the British West African shilling. So you find two shillings. This was a currency used in British West Africa at the time. And the year of mint was 1938. So you see, you, you see it and it gives you an information. You see it and quickly on, the, on top of the, of the coin is the head of the British crown. And that is Queen Elizabeth. So it gives you an information. It gives you an idea. On your right side, you find Ghana, 1958, three pence. So in 1958, as of 1958, we were not using CD. It was pence. So three pence is what you find. And therefore, it gives you valuable information as to what was happening, as to what, was, um, what currency we were using, and in which year were they minted. So on the British West African um, currency, on which you find two shillings, this was in 1938. 1958, Ghana was using pence. But today we use CD, CD and pesos. Merits of numismatics. It helps us to know the trading links established between states in the past. The names and images inscribed on the coins enable us to trace the line of kings that ruled a particular area in the past. It enables historians to know dates, names, places, and events of historical importance. It showcases the high level of ancient African civilization. Example, numismatics. Evidence shows the trade relationship between East Africa and China. And this is long time ago. So if somebody told you Africa has not been part of civilization, it's a lie. We have been the cradle, the source, and we have been an integral part in world civilization. Demerits or disadvantages. It is time consuming. The information on the coins may be misleading, especially when rusted from weathering and season. So, for example, a coin is buried underground, an archaeologist excavates and finds it and might have been there for years. The likelihood that it might have been rusted is, is high. And this will not help the archaeologist to come out with the proper information that we need to know. So that is one of the challenges of numismatics. Ethnobotany. It is a scientific study of plants in a particular environment. It provides data to show when and how a particular crop, food crop, was introduced into the area or whether the cultivation of certain crops is indigenous to the area. For example, it has been known from ethnobotanists that yam cultivation in West Africa began at the Dahomey Gap in modern-day Republic of Benin. More often, people say that 
almost everything that is here on the continent came from outside. But ethnobotanist is telling us that it's not true. There are a lot of crops, a lot of uh, plants which were and are indigenous um, on the continent. Those that are not indigenous and were also brought in, ethnobotanists will let you know. Merits. It helps historians in the selection of archaeological sites for research. It shows the interrelationship between or contacts amongst people. So when European, for example, when the missionaries came here, the first people to have introduced cocoa were the Basel missionaries. So quickly it tells you that as the point is saying, it shows the interrelationship between or contacts among people. So it tells you that at a point in time, um, people of Ghana at the time had some contact with some missionaries who came from the West Indies and they brought cocoa beans. Though they did not do well, by, by God's grace, it was Tekwashi who really, you know, brought cocoa to the height that we find it today. Through the study of ethnobotany, historians are able to tell which plants are exotic and indigenous. So, even in Ghana, we have the non-traditional crops of for export. We have the traditional crops and the non-traditional. We have some crops that were brought in um, by the missionaries and were introduced. For example, the ginger is one of those. So ethnobotanists will be able to help you to understand which of the plants were indigenous and which ones were exotic and were brought from outside. The merits of ethnobotany or disadvantages of ethnobotany, one of them is that Ethnobotanical research is time consuming. It's correct. It is also energy consuming and it also entails a lot of expenses. It is also expensive to conduct an ethnobotanical research. So, having looked at the sources from where we can tap information from to write and to reconstruct our past. What are the methods that one can, as history students and as historians, we can use the methods that we can use to write our past? It is important that we get to know because more often our history is written through the lenses of other people who are not even Africans. So it is important we write our history through our own lenses. And that is what we are, we are tasked to do. Now, methods of writing African history. Historians need to not to rely solely on written records or written sources in reconstructing Africa's past. A greater emphasis must be placed on the non-documentary sources as well, since documentary and existing documentary sources might be few and fragmentary. One method of gathering information from non-documentary sources for the writing of African history is personal inquiry through interview. Persons knowledgeable in the history and culture of the people must be sought out and interviewed. So if there's an information, if there's historical information that one needs, we need to identify the people who are blessed with such knowledge, and then we go and interview them. Another method used in the reconstruction of African past is through the use of questionnaires. So apart from interviews, we can also use questionnaires. You prepare a very nice questionnaire, you pass it on, and people with the information, the knowledge, will help you in gathering the information. It is important to note that the questions must be designed to cover the whole range of human activity which comprise political, social, religious, technology, and then economics. It is actually administered to people with relevant knowledge in the subject area the researcher is working on. The third method of gathering information for writing African history is the interdisciplinary approach. What it means is that you can't rely on just one approach. You need to do, you need to consult the other sources. So it's not only documentary source, you need to con contact the non-documentary sources as well. And within the non-documentary sources, you, don't, you need not use just one of the sources. You need to look at all of them, and that will help you to come out with a very brilliant piece of historical information. In addition, finally, a person can record events that are of historical importance as they occur. 
And the example that I keep using is the 2013 elections. I mean, petition at the Supreme Court. It has been recorded. Somebody might have recorded it, and it has become an important historical information for the person and for posterity that is to come. In a nutshell, we've come to the end of our lesson um, today. And what have we done? We have looked at the origin of the word history. And we said that history was derived from a Greek word called historia. And historia means inquiry. We've also gotten to know that history became a relevant subject of study during the 5th century BC. We've also said, we've also gotten to know how history has been used in terms of explanation that it deals with systematic recordings of the past. Again, we've looked at why we have to study African history. And we said that it helps us to be patriotic. And it also brings harmony and unity amongst the people. We've looked at the sources where we can gather information from to write and to reconstruct our past. And we've also looked at the methods that we can use to write our past. We are not living just like that. On your screen, I have some home link for you as an assignment, look at it, write it down, and answer it. In our next session, I may not ask you, but I know you'll be able to do it. But if I ask you, I know you put up your hand and you tell us that, yeah, we did it and we've gotten it. All right, thank you. We've come to the end. Be well and be safe. Protect yourself from coronavirus. Thank you. Subscribe to our YouTube channel, Joy Learning TV.